Uh, so Forrest Moyer is our archivist here and editor of our MHEP quarterly. He, he did much of the writing of the, the narrative, the, the, the stories in the panels in the exhibit. I did some, but he did much of it. And together we edited these stories and edited them again. We together selected the images and rejected images and tried to find images that worked well. So we'll turn the time over to Forrest at this point. And again, he'll be sharing photos and narrative that we used in the exhibit. So we'll turn it over to you, Forrest. All right, thanks, Joel. We'll get my uh, screen up here and hopefully you can all see this. This is one of the panels in the exhibit. This is the intro panel that you will see first when you enter the exhibit area. Uh, we tried to design something that would pull people in with a couple of questions. So I'm just gonna jump right into it here. Uh, we designed this to work uh, for people who have no knowledge or just very beginning knowledge of who Mennonites are, who Anabaptists are, and what the uh, faith tradition is about. So who are the Mennonites? Mennonites are Christians who try to obey the teachings of Jesus, such as the Sermon on the Mount, in everyday life. This is a challenging but old tradition stretching back to the early church and renewed in the 1500s by radical Anabaptists. One leader of the Anabaptists was Menno Simons, who preached nonviolence, and Mennonites take their name from him. In America, some Mennonites are old order, dressing plain and remaining separate from the world. Most Mennonites have embraced modern lifestyles and convenience, along with evangelical and or liberal social ideas. Each group follows Anabaptist principles that shape the way they live out Christian faith in their context. So what is Anabaptist faith all about? As you continue around the corner in the exhibit, you come to this map. Uh, and this is a map produced by Mennonite World Conference and it illustrates Anabaptists as they're distributed around the world today as of 2018. You'll notice um, that there are many Anabaptists in Africa these days, in North America, India, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, and a smaller number in Europe, though that is where the tradition began 400 years ago. The name, who are Anabaptists? The name means rebaptizers. It was used in 16th and 17th century Europe to describe people who believed that infant baptism, the practice of the church at that time, was wrong and that only adults can choose themselves to follow Jesus and to be baptized as Christians. This was a radical idea at the time and Anabaptists were heavily persecuted. Anabaptists hold the same basic beliefs as other Christians, but emphasize adult or self-chosen baptism, refusal of military service, and separation of church and state. In addition to Mennonites, there are several other Anabaptist traditions. The Old Order Amish, as pictured here, preserve an Anabaptist lifestyle of earlier centuries, driving horse-drawn vehicles and dressing in plain clothing. They enforce order or discipline in their community with a system of excommunication and restoration. Hutterites, named for early leader Jakob Hutter, practice communal living in the tradition of early Christians and Anabaptists. Today, their colonies are located mostly in Western Canada and the Bruderhof are a similar group. Brethren churches follow the tradition of a pietist Anabaptist congregation founded at Schwarzenau, Germany in 1708. Brethren emphasize spiritual warmth and Christian service, drawing on their pietist roots. Immersion baptism and feet washing are important symbolic rituals for the brethren. The Brethren in Christ denomination developed here in Pennsylvania in the late 1700s blending Anabaptist faith with Wesleyan revivalism. A few other historic churches in Pennsylvania, such as Quakers, Moravians, and Schwenkfelders, as uh, these elderly women are depicted here, uh, around 1905. So they weren't dressing this way anymore at that time, but these were some older women wearing the traditional dress. 
A few of these other historic churches in PA were pacifist and plain dressing, but were not Anabaptist in terms of baptizing adults uh, and, and that kind of thing. So here's a little uh, list we made up to distinguish between conservative Anabaptists and progressive Anabaptists. Because if you encounter the old order Amish or old order Mennonites, and then you go to the city and you go to a Mennonite church and you see how hugely different the lifestyle of those Mennonites is from the old order Mennonites, you may wonder how can these people be the same tradition? And you may wonder the same if you go to a liberal Catholic church or and a very conservative Catholic church or many other different traditions. Um, so conservative Anabaptists tend to trust the church more than individual judgment of church members. They tend to separate or expel members over lifestyle differences. For Anabaptists, lifestyle is very important. And they avoid worldly associations, even with other Christians. Progressive Anabaptists tend to trust individual authority and they try to maintain unity despite lifestyle differences. And they encourage friendship with the world like many other evangelicals and, and progressives. In this exhibit, we tell the stories of a few early Anabaptists who gave their lives for their faith. One of these was Margareta Sattler of Germany. Margareta was called talented and clever in her time, a Beguine sister who lived in Germany in the 1520s. Beguines were charitable lay women who lived together in community. Presumably she read the Bible in German and listened as preachers of the day debated scripture, Christian obedience and adult baptism. Experiencing spiritual rebirth as many were at the time, Margareta chose to leave the Beguines and eventually joined the Anabaptist movement. She married a former monk named Michael Sattler, and together they traveled around Southwest Germany and Alsace, preaching the gospel of a new kind of Christian fellowship, obedient and faithful to scripture, separate from corrupt state churches. But this cost them their lives. Arrested at Horb, Germany in 1527, after just a couple of uh, years, of doing uh, Anabaptist ministry and preaching, Michael and Margareta languished in prison 11 months before they were tried and executed for sedition and heresy. Michael's tongue was cut out and his flesh torn with hot tongs before being burned to death. Margareta received death by drowning, which some called mockingly her, quote, third baptism. Though offered protection by a countess, Margareta Sattler steadfastly refused to recant. She was one of thousands of women and men, thousands who died for the radical ideas of Anabaptist faith in the 16th century. One of those ideas, separation of church and state, later became a building block of democracy. This is another of the uh, whole panels that's in the exhibit. The Brüderliche Vereinigung or Brotherly Union that was drawn up at Schleitheim, Switzerland in 1527 articulated Anabaptist faith and practice in seven articles, probably written by Michael Sattler. In these articles, we hear echoes of the disciplined life of monastic orders, as well as today's old order Amish, Mennonites, and brethren. And here we give an English summary uh, made by historian John C. Wanger in 1954. So for the Anabaptists, baptism became a symbol of Christian faith and of one's personal intention to live a life united with Christ in his death and resurrection. Those who twice refused private admonition by the community of uh, believers shall on the third occasion be excommunicated from the brotherhood because of their life of sin. Only those can be admitted to the Lord's table, that is communion, uh, who have been united beforehand by Christian baptism and by a common separation from sin. The child of God is called upon by Christ to withdraw from every institution and person which is not truly Christian. Only one church officer is mentioned, the hirt, shepherd or pastor, whose duties were to read, admonish, teach, warn, discipline, excommunicate, to lead in prayer, to administer the Lord's Supper, supper and to undertake the general oversight of the congregation. The child of God is to follow absolutely the law of love as taught by the New Testament, that is to love your enemies even, 
and leave the worldly sword to the officers of the state as ordained by God. Oaths are held to be inconsistent for finite creatures and forbidden for the Christian by the express commands of scripture. Uh, Forrest, I thought some of those may generate some in interesting discussion later. So if, if there's participants or uh, attendees who take some issue with any of these or wonder about any of these uh, statements from our very first Anabaptist confession, we can certainly try and talk about or address questions or issues related to this confession. Menno Simons was an early Anabaptist leader in the Netherlands. He had been a Catholic priest in West Friesland, but was converted and rebaptized in 1536. Mennonites take their name from him. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Menno lived to die a natural death, though he spent most of his life on the run. His writings were circulated widely and helped to solidify a nonviolent witness and identity for the Anabaptist community. Here is a passage from Menno's reply to false accusations in 1552. He said, true Christians do not know vengeance, no matter how they are mistreated. In patience, they possess their souls and they do not break their peace, even if they should be, be, should be tempted by bondage, torture, poverty, and besides by the sword and fire. They do not cry vengeance, vengeance as does the world, but with Christ they supplicate and pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. According to the declaration of the prophets, they have beaten their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, Christ. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Another Dutch Anabaptist, Dirk Willems, became an icon of sacrificial love. His story was recorded in the Martyr's Mirror, a large book of Anabaptist stories compiled in Holland in the 17th century. In 1569, Dirk was fleeing a prison guard. He ran across thin ice and the agent followed, breaking through the ice. Amazingly, Dirk stopped and returned to save his pursuer's life, knowing that he could face death if arrested. The grateful guard wanted to let Willems go, but the town mayor sternly reminded him of his oath and Willems was arrested. Shortly thereafter, he was burned at the stake in Gelderland. And the martyr's mirror says, a strong east wind blowing that day, the kindled fire was much driven away from the upper part of his body as he stood at the stake. In consequence of which this good man suffered a lingering death insomuch that in the town of Lairdum, towards which the wind was blowing, he was heard to exclaim over 70 times, oh my Lord, my God, etc." This illustration from the Martyr's Mirror of Dirk Willems risking his life to save an enemy has been used frequently to teach principles of radical love and forgiveness. Gilly Greenwood of London, England wrote in the year 2000, Dirk Willems arrested me. She continued, I came across the Anabaptists in the context of a history lesson. If it wasn't for Dirk Willems courageous and merciful action, I don't think I would have been arrested by Anabaptists at all. But Dirk's choice intrigued me, and I started thinking about peacemaking. I was strongly attracted to these people because they were gentle, and the ideas they explored taught me about the radical ways of nonviolence in Jesus's life and in Anabaptist lives today. Up until I met Anabaptists, I hadn't engaged with this Jesus and his followers who were learning to be gentle but firm and creative in the face of conflict and injustice. This, the impact has rooted my values in hope and prayer. And uh, Gilly's statement was published in the book, Coming Home, Stories of Anabaptists in Britain and Ireland, uh, published by Pandora Press in the year 2000. The next panel in the exhibit is titled, Becoming the Quiet in the Land, as Anabaptists have often been referred to. And we chose this picture um, that was painted some, a uh, couple centuries later, uh, in 1850 by a Swiss artist, um, but we thought it depicts the uh, Swiss Anabaptist uh, family setting very well. Persecution continued in Switzerland throughout the 1600s, driving most Anabaptists to leave Switzerland and move to Germany. 
Others fled into the Jura Mountains and Alsace, where the Amish, named for Bishop Jakob Amon, emerged as a stricter branch in the 1690s. Many Anabaptists had families to care for and protect. Though executions ceased, the continued threat of, of prison, banishment, and property seizure forced Anabaptists away from evangelism and into a protective mode of social quietism. In the 17th century, Anabaptists opted for survival, a disciplined, quote, quiet and peaceable life, non-evangelistic, in communities where they were tolerated by local authorities. Often they could not own land and were required to pay special taxes. Mennonites and Amish turned inward to their own church community for everything from support and mutual aid to economic opportunities, marriage, education, et cetera, and they transplanted that approach to Pennsylvania. To shape their Christian witness and live above reproach, Anabaptists drew inspiration from scripture passages like Romans chapter 12. And some of us memorized some of these scripture passages uh, as um, a basis for our faith, even in the um, 20th century, late 20th century when I was growing up. Romans 12, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let love be without pretense. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing always in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And I should say that a lot of preaching in the Anabaptist tradition is sort of recitation of scripture verses like this. Um, so you would go to church uh, and you would hear these passages of scripture repeated by the preachers week after week um, in your growing up years and that kind of thing. Now, in modern times, sermons have become more complex in the more progressive churches, but uh, the tradition is more very scripture-based like that. William Penn and other Quakers traveled among Mennonites in Germany in the 1670s, preaching the gospel of the Society of Friends. In the Lower Rhine Valley, they made a number of converts from Mennonite families. A decade later, these families became the core of the Germantown settlement in Pennsylvania, beginning in 1683. As word spread in Europe of the new Quaker colony in Pennsylvania, Mennonites and other Palatines began making plans to emigrate. They faced a risky journey of weeks, sometimes months even, on the open sea, and most would never see their old homeland or loved, or loved ones again. But the opportunity to own a farm in the new world, unoppressed by state churches and endless war, made it worth the risk. One family's journey from Europe to Pennsylvania can be illustrated with this Bible. Originally from near Zurich, Switzerland, the Anabaptist Schnabli, or we say here in America now, Snavely family, was living at Baldenheim Alsace in the 1660s. A preacher there, Jakob Schnabli, with others, affirmed the Dutch Mennonite Confession of Faith at that time. By the 1690s, this family was living at Ibersheim, near Mannheim in the German Palatinate. Here in 1696, excuse me, Hans Jakob Schnabli owned and signed this large old Bible that is now part of the Mennonite Heritage Center collection. It was printed at Zurich in 1536 in the time of the early Anabaptists. The book contains a beautiful hand-drawn book plate from Matthias Schnabel at the Eversheimer Hof in 1708. You can see that on uh, the left there. This is one of the few pieces of Frachter art brought to this country by colonial immigrants. 
widow Elizabeth Schnabley of Mannheim, possibly the widow of Hans Jakob, married Dielman Kolb from Wolfsheim near Altsee in 1714. They came to Pennsylvania in 1717, settling at Salford. At least two of her Schnabley sons also emigrated to Pennsylvania later, around 1730. Maria Schnabley, apparently a daughter of Hans Jakob, married Hans Georg Bachmann, or Hans George Bachmann, around 1715 and inherited this Bible. They came to Pennsylvania by 1727, bringing the Bible, and soon settled at Saucon in what later became Lehigh County, and were among the founders of the Saucon Mennonite Congregation. So this is an artifact that has survived from the time of the early Anabaptists and been held by Anabaptist families all the way through uh, to it eventually was sold on an auction here in Pennsylvania, but amazingly made its, <laughs> made its way back uh, to a local auction house here and, and we were able to uh, purchase it for the collection, which was pretty amazing. In 1745, with the flames of war mounting higher and higher, as they said, Mennonite leaders in Eastern Pennsylvania saw a test of conscience looming for nonviolent Christians. And they wrote to friends in the Netherlands requesting a translation of the great Dutch Anabaptist martyr book, The Martyr's Mirror, first published in 1660. The Dutch were slow to respond, so the Pennsylvania Mennonites went ahead and had the book translated and printed within a few years in 1748 and 49 at the productive mystical Ephrata commune in the, in the woods of Northern Lancaster County. It was a quiet but phenomenal accomplishment, the largest book printed in colonial America. Many Mennonite and Brethren families bought a copy and the Martyr's Mirror served for the next two centuries as the main documentary source for American memory of Anabaptist roots and nonviolent witness. And I will just tell you what the uh, title page says here. Uh, des blutigen Schauplatzes oder Martyrerspiegels der Taufsgesinnten oder Wehrlosen Christen, which uh, translated to English is the, the bloody theater or martyr's mirror of the baptism minded or defenseless Christians. And this second part, the first part is martyrs up to the time of the Anabaptists uh, and the, great, the Reformation in Europe from Christ to the Reformation. This part in the back is all Anabaptist martyrs. The American Revolution was a time of testing for religious pacifists in Pennsylvania, including Mennonites. Many tried to remain neutral, not wanting to support a revolutionary government. When Mennonites had arrived in Pennsylvania a generation or two earlier, they had pledged their allegiance to the King of England, and most believed they shouldn't deny that loyalty even 50 years later. In addition, their pacifist principles forbade participation in the militia. This illustration is artist Howard Pyle's imagining of the scene at the attack on the Chew House during the Battle of Germantown, just down the street from the Mennonite meeting house that was built a few years earlier and which is still standing today. This house is also still standing. It's called Clifton uh, and you, I think you can visit it at least when the pandemic's over. At the beginning of the revolution, Mennonite leaders in Pennsylvania appealed to the provincial government they said through uh, Minister Benjamin Hershey, we have dedicated ourselves to serve all men in everything that can be helpful to the preservation of men's lives, but we find no freedom in giving or doing or assisting in anything by which men's lives are destroyed or hurt. And this became the standard position of Mennonites in this country uh, when it came to matters of war or serving in militias. Um, and so it was sort of laid a good foundation for um, the government to understand the position of Mennonites. And gradually it became to be respected a little bit more and, and some alternative service options were given in the 20th century, which we'll see in a bit. After the war was over and the United States formed, uh, things quieted down in the Pennsylvania countryside and Anabaptists resumed their hardworking, humble, and separatist lifestyle. A German hymn sung by Mennonites and Brethren of Eastern Pennsylvania in the 19th century captures the simple devotional piety of those days. The first line sounds like this. De modis die schönste Tugend. 
Translated, this means humility is the most beautiful virtue. Anabaptists sought to, quote, live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. That's a quote from Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Anything hoch, that is high, or proud, self-assertive, could be met with raised eyebrows and a visit from the church deacon. If your new house or carriage were too fancy, your children too boisterous, or your business too freewheeling, the church could ask you to rein it in or correct course. The old order still practice this kind of accountability. Another verse of the hymn reads, See the humble life of Jesus. See he never served himself. The flip side of accountability is support. Anabaptists in America developed a strong discipline of service and mutual aid. They practiced serving one another through a ritual, a feet washing, as depicted in this painting of Brethren Love Feast or Communion. The discipline of service extended beyond their own churches as Anabaptists had opportunity to contribute to the needs of neighbors in quiet and humble ways. This service to outsiders became more pronounced in the 20th century. Keeping a low profile was a survival technique during this time, perhaps subconscious. Anabaptists still smarted from their ancestors' suffering in Europe and their own marginalization during the American Revolution. They preferred to avoid critical attention. The next panel is titled Leaving Quietism and kind of characterizes the second half of the 19th century and some of the changes that came really significant changes. In the mid 1800s, public school came to Pennsylvania, which was conducted entirely in the English language. While continuing to speak Pennsylvania Dutch at home and high German at church, Mennonites began to read English newspapers and books by evangelical authors. Some attended revival meetings like the one depicted here. Many converted to Methodism or other evangelical groups, especially those who moved west. The Mennonite community fractured. Locally, two new progressive groups formed, an East Pennsylvania Mennonite Conference in 1847, this later became the Eastern District Conference of the General Conference Mennonite Denomination, and a Methodist-style Evangelical Mennonite Society in 1858. Today, this is known as the Bible Fellowship Church. Both groups encouraged mission work, higher education, and the professionalization of ministry. And uh, just to explain this picture a little bit, um, this uh, was a tabernacle. This was a huge movable tent church, it was called um, by some, that was sponsored by the Philadelphia YMCA for revival and evangelistic prayer meetings, that kind of thing uh, here in the Philadelphia region. And then it also traveled to points west um, and local evangelists would participate in these meetings, including one Mennonite that we know of, Jonas Schultz, um, and you can see this is in a book that's dealing with the issue of evangelization of children. Um, so it's already starting to um, depart a little bit from the Anabaptist tradition of uh, baptizing adults, waiting until people are uh, adults to be baptized or converted. The main body of old Mennonites, as they were called, quote, old Mennonites, continued a separate and quietest way for many years, beginning only gradually to allow Sunday schools around 1880, 80, that is, revival meetings, English preaching and singing around 1900, and mission work around 1920. But they continued to enforce nonconformity or separation from the world through plain dress and other rules until the 1960s, when the idea of separation from the world largely evaporated. Progressive Bishop John H. Oberholzer described the changes of the late, 17th, the late 19th century. Many were awakened, he said, from spiritual slumber and transposed into a spiritual life. Worship meetings were attended more zealously and diligently by young and old. The preached word sounded at all places with earnestness, power, and reception. Sleeping ceased in many meetings and reverence and quiet increased. Yes, people began to search the Holy Scripture and pray more diligently at home. In a word, it gave the impression as though many were asking, 
What must I do to be saved? The overarching theme of the early to mid 20th century was an increase in activity for both conservative and progressive Mennonites. And you can see here on this bulletin cover from Zion Mennonite Church in Souderton, all these activities they had going on down here, including pic a picnic and activities for young folks. Um, they have a vacation Bible school going on. They've got their church in a more Protestant style with a bell tower. Um, and they're really uh, starting to get a lot of church activities going there in Souderton as the town was growing up around it. Mission churches in city and country, international missions, and a plethora of social activities for young and old became the standard in Mennonite and Brethren churches outside the old order community. Even some Amish took up activities in evangelism. Conservative groups enforced strict, be strict dress and behavior rules to carry group identity as they engaged with the world and with other Christians. Progressive, progressives gave up markers of separation while continuing to teach peacemaking, adult baptism, and non-swearing of oaths. Both streams became influenced by evangelical fundamentalism, while many urban and suburban congregations leaned toward liturgical forms and socially progressive ideas. Through mission, Anabaptists entered the marketplace of religion in America. Since the 17th century, Anabaptist faith and identity had been largely restricted to those born to Anabaptist families. Now, speaking the same language as their neighbors and with greater access to books, radio, and television, fast and easy transportation and communication tools, Mennonites and brethren could listen and share with other Christians, gaining many converts from diverse backgrounds and around the world. Anabaptists learned that they need not be a marginal persecuted people as their ancestors were in Europe. Instead, they have a unique perspective on the gospel that can be helpful to the larger Christian community and the world. In turn, they became willing to incorporate new ideas and practices from other traditions. Old order Anabaptists continue to resist these impulses. The next panel is a profile in mission about James and Rowena Lark. In 1946, James Henry Lark became the first African-American person ordained to ministry in the Mennonite church. He and wife Rowena were visionary church planters in cities across the country, but their Mennonite story began in rural Eastern Pennsylvania. They lived on a farm near the Rocky Ridge Mennonite Mission east of Quakertown, Bucks County. James recalled that one wintry morning in the early 1930s, Mission workers Linford Hackman and Abram Landis stopped by his house and asked him to go with them up the mountain to help two elderly men who were snowed in. James and Rowena's children were already attending the Mennonite Sunday School. The Larks were impressed with how the Mennonites helped with real needs, bringing food, chopping wood, cleaning, and laundry. Rowena and James joined the Rocky Ridge congregation in 1935 and were dedicated workers for the gospel ever after. They moved to Rowena's home city of Washington, D.C., and became involved with missions in Virginia. But when Virginia Mennonite Conference segregated their churches by race in 1940, the Larks moved north to Chicago, where they were welcomed by the Mennonite community, and James was soon ordained. In 1954, he was ordained bishop. According to their friend and co-worker, Leroy Beckler, James and Rowena Lark carried a vision of the church as a spirit-directed community that excludes no one. Despite challenges and complacency from white Mennonites, they believed that the Mennonite church had the capacity for including people of color, and they worked as self-described, quote, tugboaters toward that end. Their vision continues to bear fruit as the church today works to become more inclusive and diverse. Hubert Brown, another Mennonite pastor, in a biographical sketch of James Lark in the Mennonite Yearbook 19, 1981, said, Lark was a man who was 50 years ahead of his time in vision and concern for the growth of the Mennonite church in urban areas. During his long ministry, he always challenged his fellow Mennonites by saying, by asking, what is your plan? What is your program? 
The life and legacy of James and Rowena Lark stands as, as an example of what God can do if people are open to the Spirit's leading. Alex Lark, their youngest son, pictured here, said of his parents, here was a case of functional discipleship. The other main area of Mennonite mission has been in relief and service work. This was really kickstarted by the World Wars of the 20th century. The United States entry into World War I in April 1917 jolted rural and mostly insulated American Mennonites with a universal military draft. Caught unprepared, Mennonite leaders had not negotiated with the government for alternate service options. Conscription placed drafted conscientious objectors in the same military camps with soldiers in training, creating situations of harassment and abuse. And you see here on the discharge papers for Norman Durstein, a local conscientious objector, um, that it says in red here, he, he refused he do, to do any military duty whatsoever, and he refused to wear the uniform, which was what they, these young men were advised by the church to do, by the conservative Mennonites, the old Mennonites at that time. The story is a little different with the, the progressive Mennonites. Many of uh, more progressive Mennonites were willing to do um, uh, medic, medic, to be serve as medics in the military. The experience of Mennonite leaders and drafted men during World War I showed they needed to be proactive in negotiating with government leaders before another war loomed. This led to inter-Mennonite planning and work with other historic peace churches, such as the Brethren and Quakers, on a shared peace witness in the 1920s and 1930s. They drafted a proposal for a civilian service option, which was presented to President Franklin Roosevelt. As a result, the Selective Service Act of 1940 allowed for the creation of civilian public service camps for drafted conscientious subjectors during World War II. And this is a picture of one of those uh, work crews at one of those camps. The experience of Mennonites and Brethren in CPS camps during World War II was transformative. It led to proactive concern for and involvement in relief and reconstruction work immediately after World War II and in the decades following. Mennonite participation in alternate, that is drafted, and voluntary service continued to grow in the second half of the 20th century through new interest in mental health work, disaster and relief work, international development work, and social justice concerns. This is a picture of a um, Mennonite disaster service crew working to clean up after Hurricane Agnes in Wilkes-Barre, PA in 1972, in case you couldn't read the caption there. The late 20th century was a time when old boundaries began to disappear and new lines emerged. Most old Mennonites took on the lifestyle, education, and individualism of progressives. Some new Mennonites returned to strong pacifist and Anabaptist identity after the world wars. Convergence happened on a national level. This is a photo of women from the old Mennonite church and new Mennonite, uh, the old Mennonite and new Mennonite denominations working together on a corn canning project at the first joint assembly of the two denominations held here in Eastern PA at Bethlehem in 1983. And the photo just happens to include my grandmother who is this woman here on the right. Um, so by 1995, these two largest denominations approved a merger. During the merge, a new division was proposed along national lines this time. Two nationally identified churches resulted, Mennonite Church USA and Mennonite Church Canada in full communion with one another. Locally, churches that were divided since 1847, Franconia Conference, the old Mennonites, and Eastern District Conference, the new Mennonites, were drawn together by cooperation in education, service, mission, and service. Some separation also occurred. Around the year 2000, the Eastern District lost eight congregations, including some of their most historic, when the conference voted to join Mennonite Church USA. These congregations withdrew over concern that the denomination would not focus enough on salvation and biblical authority. They founded a new Alliance of Mennonite Evangelical Congregations. In 1997, Franconia Conference voted to expel the progressive Germantown congregation due to acceptance of gay and lesbian members. 
The vote, which was controversially conducted by mail-in ballot rather than in person, was divisive within the conference and received much attention from outsiders who argued for one side or the other. Franconia Mennonites were left asking, what is the basis of Christian unity? Boundaries or a center in Jesus? Two decades later in 2019, Franconia and Eastern District Conferences were reunited by unanimous vote to lay aside old identities and become a new body with new vision, Mosaic Conference of Mennonite Church USA. And this is how the new conference is described. Mosaic Mennonite Conference is a community of congregations and nonprofit ministries committed to li living like Jesus together. Located in multiple US states and with global connections, we believe God's design is for all people in all places to flourish and to be transformed by loving mutual relationships with God and one another. To see this become a reality by the power of the spirit, we shape our lives and our work together around missional, intercultural, and formational priorities. The exhibit concludes with several quotes from local Mennonite voices past and present that reflect the values at the heart of Anabaptist faith. Emphases vary somewhat depending on the era, but there are consistent themes that hark back to the stories we've already shared. So I'm just going to put these up and read through the quotes uh, so we can get a sense of the values. Silas Grubb, pastor in Philadelphia, said in 1913, to bear the name of Mennonite means to be a representative in this generation of that church whose birth came by the fire of persecution and whose growth involved the dangers, privations, and struggles of pilgrim bands in many lands. For centuries, our people have been regarded as harmless idle dreamers. Their consistent maintenance of peace principles sometimes gained sympathy for them, but too often contempt was the only thing given them. Today, it must be admitted that they were far in advance of other Christians in this particular. Jumping back to 1807, Christian Funk, a bishop who had been excommunicated in Franconia, described a reconciliation experience. When they called us in again, Bishop Gross said, we want to pray, and we kneeled. And then Gross said, Funk, we have nothing against your speech. We are satisfied with it. But because the 10 ministers who banned you have died, we don't like to say that the ban is altogether just or altogether unjust. They main ch maintain church discipline as they understood it, and we maintain discipline as we understand it. And we want to let bygones be bygones and make peace. To the astonishment of all, Jacob Oberholzer approached me silently with humility and words which belong to genuine peace, asking me to forgive him. And so I treated him the same way too, and we shook hands and greeted each other with a kiss. And Jacob Gross said, if I have trespassed against you or your people, forgive me. And so I said the same, and we shook hands and kissed. And Henry Rosenberger also in the same way, and all who were present. John Guile, in a farewell letter to his congregation at Lyon Lexington in 1852, emphasized love. Love is the badge of the disciples of Jesus. If you have not love for one another, you are not disciples. But you must follow after peace and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Earnestly endeavor to maintain love and unity, and you shall be strong and stand firm. Let love run through all your dealings with each other. Be not credulous. If you hear evil reports of your brethren or sisters, or anything which may injure their honor or reputation, believe, hope, and wish the best concerning them, rather than the worst. This is the disposition of love. Bear with each other in patience and forgive one another, even as God has forgiven you in Christ. The closing lines of the farewell as published, which we show here in the picture, as published by Moritz Loeb at Doylestown are uh, pictured here. They read in translation, now good night, you dear youth, God bless and keep you. He adorns you with discipline and virtue and brings you to his kingdom. Good night to you all, or all gathered, young and old, tall and small, with love from your brother and servant, John Guile. Anne Olibach, a scholar, reformer, and urban mission worker, 
was the first woman ordained by Mennonites in 1911, and she wrote in an article in 1901. In walking along one of the prominent streets in the northern part of Philadelphia, the writer overheard a colored servant coming to the front of the house to do some scrubbing, unconsciously muttering to herself, I'm nearly dead. Why should servants be so tired, nearly dead? In many instances, it is overwork, but I can truly say in many more, it is a lack of sympathy on the part of employers. When we feel that help is needed in the home, we should likewise feel for those who consent to help. Oh, how harsh it rings in a servant's ears when there is that lack of sympathy, no encouraging word, no smile, no courtesy, but do this, do that, and hurry too. Is it any wonder that they are tired, nearly dead? Love is wanting everywhere. Do we long for it? Do we have it? If so, let's show it. Manuel and Clara Nunez came to Souderton in the 1960s said, the Mennonites who reached out to us and our families in the 1960s when we came from Cuba to Souderton modeled self-giving love and sacrifice to others after the pattern of Jesus. We have fond memories of their kindness and gentleness. For example, on bus trips to New York or Washington, the Cubans would smoke and the Mennonites would not complain or coerce, but simply open their windows. We have tried to continue this tradition of gentleness in our interaction with people including new immigrants, and we hope that younger generations of Mennonites will continue in the same way. Yvonne Platz, an anti-racism and justice worker who lives in Norristown, said in 2008, there was one thing I knew about the Mennonite faith, that there was love, there was love for me. And I didn't see a lot of that love in some of the other churches I visited. I quickly came back to Nueva Vida Mennonite Church real fast. I did not realize how rich my Mennonite heritage was. I've been giving back for a long time these core principles and values that I learned as a child. Evangelism, peacemaking, community and leadership development, important aspects of what I do today. No, I don't have a Swiss and German heritage, but Anabaptist and Mennonite, I am. And in 2020, Hendy Matahalemuel, another pastor in Philadelphia said in an article, I am an Anabaptist because I am willing to be transformed to become more like Christ every day. This time is crucial for Anabaptists to bear a peace witness to the world. We must step outside our comfort zones and be agents of transformation. Let us cross national, political, cultural, and ideological boundaries and be a bridge for people so Jesus can walk on it. And we want to also thank our exhibit sponsors, um, these churches, Blooming Glen Mennonite Church, Franconia Mennonite Church, Plains and Zion Mennonite Churches, uh, all gave funds towards sponsoring this exhibit. And we're very thankful for their support. Um, the exhibit panels were designed by Steve Leinbach of Leinbach Design uh, in Telford. And we're of course very thankful for his uh, artistry in that also. Um, the Mennonite Heritage, is Mennonite Heritage Center is located at 565 Yoda Road, Harleysville, and you're welcome to come and uh, see this exhibit in person. There's a few more uh, panels that we didn't include in this uh, reading of the exhibit. Our hours are Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 5, and Saturday, 10 to 2. You can visit our website and blog at mhgp.org, and you can also make donations on our website, which are tax deductible and much appreciated. So Joel, I'll hand it back to you now. I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, if you have questions that you can, yeah. came in, we can try to answer them. Yeah, there's, there are some questions. And uh, thank you, Forrest, so much. I know that that took a, a fair amount of time and energy just to put this all together into a manageable form. Uh, even though we wrote these panels, these, these stories some months ago, but to do it in this way took an additional... Uh, level of time and energy. So thanks for that. Um, we, uh, we do have several, let me pull up the, uh, the questions. We do have several questions I saw coming in um, from, from Cynthia. Um, she, uh, Cindy Sheet, she uh, was a very valuable overview for me as I have recently become a part of the Mennonite church. I'm curious about the concept of excommunication 
And if that takes place today, uh, we can. It Boris, does. Go ahead. We, we can talk <laughs> not, about that. <laughs> not in the not among progressive and evangelical Mennonites generally, unless you really do something really super bad, maybe you'd be excommunicated. But usually in progressive churches, you're just kind of you just kind of walk away from the church if you do something that bad. But in the old order church, um, if you do something that offends the church in some way, you will be set back from communion um, and put under the ban as Christian Funk was until you are restored. So you have to show your sincerity and um, ask for the forgiveness of the church, that kind of thing. Joel, do you wanna describe that? Any, any yeah, I, I think, I think the first, traditionally, the first uh, level or step of, of discipline was to just be set back from communion for a time or two until you might repent or confess the error of your ways. And then if you didn't, then ex excommunication, which is, um, and then, then the, the practice of the ban is the most extreme um, uh, version of discipline and, and Historic Anabaptist groups, um, the, uh, some of the old order Amish uh, practiced the ban. M Menno Simons himself reluctantly, you know, back in the 16th century, reluctantly agreed to the practice of the ban. I think he was sort of coerced or persuaded from some of his uh, fellow leaders. But th with the ban, then you're to, then, then members, members who remain in the congregation are to avoid that person socially and in business avoid economic or social connections. Husbands and wives are not supposed to have relationships when someone is under the ban. And so there's today, there's, you know, I think various levels of expression even of that um, among certain old order groups. I don't, I don't believe the old order Mennonites practice the ban. I, that's my understanding. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think Cindy was wondering about the contemporary, among contemporary progressive Mennonites, uh, the practice of excommunication. I think you explained it well, Forrest. Um, no, there's no formal excommunication really anymore among, among progressive Mennonites, um, but people will start to avoid you. <laughs> if, you, if you go against the standards of the church or whatever, or if you take a position that is at odds with the church, um, you'll be edged out basically. That's, sorry, and, I mean, maybe, maybe that's too cynical, but, and it, I think it's that way in most Christian churches probably, or most religious groups. I mean, in, in some congregations, I think among pro progressive congregations, you'll, you'll find today some, some attempts at, um, you know, mutual accountability and, and discipline. Uh, there'll be some attempts at correction and, um, maybe more more quietly, not not in a public way, but between pastoral leadership and and the member who's having some difficulty. Um, there may not be a public announcement as it would have been 50, 60, 70 years ago among the old Mennonites. Um, but the community was a lot more intimately acquainted with one another years ago too. So these days people live more private lives and. Mm -hmm. And not the whole congregation doesn't necessarily know know all your business or whatever. Right. All right. Let's move uh, on to another question. Yeah, another question from another Joel. Um, did other did the other Anabaptist groups you mentioned, Amish, Hutterites, Brethren, undergo similar splits and realignments in in the mid nineteenth century? And that that is a, a good question. And yes, in, in most cases, maybe maybe not so much among the. Hutterites, but yes, among the Amish and the Brethren, particularly in the second half, the later half of the part of the 19th century, there, there were divisions and realignments, definitely realignments, uh, particularly among the Amish. Some of the more progressive Amish ended up aligning with the old Mennonites in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and so you had, yeah, among the Amish, you had this, uh, was it a two-way or sort of three-way division in forest in the 1870s and 80s, those who became old order eventually, and then the, the progressives who became Amish Mennonite. And some of, the, some of those, those folks or their descendants today are progressive Mennonite groups like the Atlantic Coast Conference of the Mennonite, right. of Mennonite Church USA. Um, 
and among the brethren, Forrest, you speak more to the brethren, there was kind of a three-way separation and division in the late 19th century. Right. So in the brethren, you had um, what became the brethren church. There's the church of the brethren, which was the main body. And then you had, that's the modern name for the main body. They used to be called German Baptist brethren. And then you had this three-way split in the late uh, 19th century where you had an old order group develop that wanted to preserve and even become a little more conservative. And then they're called the old order German Baptist brethren and they're still around today. And they recently had a split, a halfway split uh, over cell phones, I think. And then you have the other um, wing, the other uh, left wing, which would have been sort of the, um, what is called the brethren church or the Grace Brethren, that tradition is becoming more evangelical and evangelistic uh, and revivalistic. And then you had the Church of the Brethren sort of down the middle. Um, the mainline, the mainline group. <laughs> but they kept some of the rules for a period of time and that kind of thing. So yeah, one thing I tend to say to people is that you, you might notice that Baptists tend to like split a lot over theological points, points of doctrine. Um, you know, everybody has to believe the right thing. With Anabaptist groups, it tends to be lifestyle issues or ethical issues. So the way you live out your faith is what people will be willing to separate over um, and start a new church over or whatever. Yeah, I'll, I think we'll, we'll move on. Um, I, I know less about how the, the Hutterites, I think, had some separation too after they arrived here in North America in the late 19th century. There was separate groups, even in the early 20th century, separate groups of Hutterites that develop, but I think we'll, we'll move on past that. Um, another question, um, this is more of a, a genealogical question, I think, from Rod and Mary Lou. Is Christian Funk a part of the Funks from Coventry, Chester County? Um, well, just, yeah, related, related. He's not from the Chester County Funks. Um, but some of his uh, Christian funks, I think nephews, nieces and nephews ended up in Chester County of Vincent and Coventry. <clears throat> okay, another one from another Joel. Over the past 20 years or 20 or so years has the population of Franconia Conference and its successors increased or decreased? That's a very good question, Forrest, you wanna? Take. Well, Franconia Conf what was Franconia Conference, which does not exist anymore, um, that I would say the numbers have decreased mm -hmm. uh, in those congregations um, which formed the Franconia Conference. Same for Eastern District Conference. Um, both of those have reduced. But Mosaic Conference has brought in um, many people in Philadelphia, uh, more recent immigrant churches, and now in other states also, um, who wanted to join Mosaic Mennonite Conference. And so Mosaic Conference has grown larger than either of what Franconi Conference or Eastern District was, I think. Or Eastern, right. And the, the Eastern District also experienced decline in membership and over the la before this merger last, last year, uh, the 20 or 30 years before that, the Eastern District is, right. experienced a similar decline. Um, but yes, with Mosaic Conference, and particularly the, the cutting edge of growth, I think is one way to put it, uh, the growth areas for Mosaic Conference and the former Franconia Conference were among our, our newer um, immigrant or urban churches in Philadelphia and Norristown. That's where the growth, the growth has been and still is and probably will be for a while. Um, I don't know if we want to tackle this now, um, or we can try. Are, are the U.S. Uh, U.S. military authorities currently accepting of Mennonite pacifism? Hmm. Who knows? We haven't had a draft in how long? <laughs> in about the, what? The big, but, yeah. The bigger question, I think, is when when a draft does occur again, how many Mennonite churches will be willing to push their young people to refuse military service? Or how many Mennonite young people will be willing to take an a, sort of an absolute stand and say they're not willing to do military service? Mm -hmm. um, because that's what would necessitate alternate service is if people aren't willing to serve in the military in any capacity. Mm -hmm. But that hasn't been tested since the 1970s. Yeah. 
Well, around 1990, with the uh, the first Gulf War, there was there was more pressure. There was the threat of war and the threat of the draft there for a bit, and there was pressure. Young Mennonite men at that point, especially, were, were dealing with it, were thinking about it more, and were sort of preparing for the possibility of a draft, at least in some of our congregations, and we're talking about it. But since then, there hasn't been the pressure or the threat of a draft. Um, okay. I see another question here from Sarah. How do you think the early Anabaptists would react to the Mennonite church of today? Mm -hmm. What would they be most or least surprised by? Oh, I can tell. I think they'd probably be least surprised by the what they would describe as the sinfulness of humanity. <laughs> the, um, they would say that the temptations people face are the same temptations they faced in their time in the 1500s. Um, they would not be, I do not think that most early Anabaptists would be very pleased, probably with the lifestyle of the majority of assimilated Mennonites right. today. The, the, acculturated, the acculturated or in many cases well-to-do well uh, lifestyle of us. <laughs> um, they they were radical. So they would say, yeah, we probably would say we should all be living a more radical witness to the lifestyle of Jesus. Or yeah, I think mo most of us are, if we're honest, are too, too settled, <laughs> too quiet. Um, I mean, am I willing to go and live a lifestyle that's going to get me killed? Probably not, you know, but they were in that time. <laughs> but um, yeah, the early Anabaptists were quite radical and were, were willing to suffer and, and die for their faith. And yet, you know, there, we have stories from the early early decades and centuries of those who, you know, weren't quite so perfect or weren't quite the heroes that we might like to make them out to be. I think, I think the early Anabaptists would find commonality among some of our our newer ethnic congregations or or. Mennonites, Anabaptists, and parts of the world where there's where there is lots of suffering, and where people are are taking um, risks and taking a, a stand for their their faith. I, I think the early Anabaptists would find affinity and uh, fellowship with some of these newer ethnic or immigrant groups that are coming to North America. I, I think. Right. That's a that's a hard question, um, but it's a church. I think a question that all churches, not just Anabaptists, um, should be thinking about is: Do we, if we if we call ourselves Christians, are we um, living the way Jesus lived, or the risk, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of risky life that Jesus or other our our foreparents are of faith lived? I don't yeah. know. Um, here's. We're getting past eight, but there's a couple more pretty good questions. Um, Steve, Steve Gutzel Myers asked uh, early in the exhibit, excommunication is mentioned. Were women also excommunicated, and if so, on what basis? I think the simple answer is yes, they were. Um, what well, I'm not sure if he's asked were there more pressures of uh, di disciplinary pressures on women in the early years. I, I, I don't know about that. I'd say in the 19th and 20th century, the uh, cultural expectations, religious expectations were harder. More was placed on women to conform to, to, um, to maintain the visible witness, the main, main visible identity of separation in their clothing and their, their, their hairstyles and whatever. I think that was harder on women in the 19th and 20th century. I'm not sure about the early centuries, but certainly women were excommunicated. Um, There's probably too many questions for us to answer here. Um, yeah. I'm just seeing a couple. Somebody asked about did Mennonites own slaves in the 18th and 19th century? Generally, Mennonites did not own slaves. Um, slavery was not common on in continental Europe that I'm aware of, um, so they weren't used to that. In, in Europe, 
And um, I think they were opposed on, on ethical grounds to- For the most part. I think they were asking about 18, I, some months ago, I, I had done some research on that topic and I, you know, I found here in this area in the early 19th century, one, one or two uh, pieces of evidence of a person who appeared to be a Mennonite owning a slave and then freeing that slave, like in whatever, 1796 or something like that. Um, that was an, another Zoom session that <laughs> I was a part of some months ago. Um, but yeah, evidence of sla slave, uh, slave owners among Mennonites here in Pennsylvania is, is pretty rare. I'm, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but um, I made an attempt to look into that and didn't find a lot of evidence. But I'll say I found a couple examples of people who probably were Mennonites owning a slave, but can't tell for sure. <laughs> But Mennonites did have indentured servants regularly, mm -hmm. <laughs> frequently, and you know how good they treated their indentured servant would vary from uh, family to family, I suppose. Yeah. Um, uh, someone's asking, will and I didn't mention this there. Will this Zoom session be available to view later? Yes, the we're, we are recording it. We may not include the Q and A session here at the end in the recording, but it will be. Post the recording of the main presentation by Forrest will be on our U YouTube channel and on our website. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, shall we take one more question? Um, oh, this is a this is a pretty. Uh, I'll read it. It's a long question, and it may take uh, more discussion later. In the 18th century and the first half of the 19th, how common or uncommon was it for Quakers and Mennonites and other Christian congregations to attend each other, each other's meeting houses or worship services when their own was closed on that particular Sunday? That's a, that's a good question coming from Marianne. Uh, I think they did. Uh, the more. Perhaps the more pious your family was, you would you would find a church to go to every Sunday or whatever. If, mm -hmm. if you were passionate about sort of church work, you might attend a Baptist church sometimes or whatever. I, I, you wouldn't be penalized for attending a worship yeah. service of another church, as far as I know. No, no. I think she may, it's Marianne Hagee, maybe getting at, there's stories from the local area for example, a Tomensa Mennonite in the early 20th century, early 1900s, maybe late 19th century, of the Mennonite preacher at Tomensa occasionally exchanging a pulpit with the Reformed pastor at, at uh, the Christ Union Church there near mainland, near, near Tomensa Mennonite, actually. They, would, well, they were good friends, those two uh, pastors, and they would exchange pulpits and Probably their their members sometimes visited visited each other's congregations. I would think you'd only really get in trouble with the Mennonite Church if you tried to bring in too many new ideas and change the tradition or change the practice in the Mennonite Church. That was considered sort of presumptuous and and dangerous, and so you, that was discouraged. Yeah. But you were certainly welcome to vis visit around. Yeah. So there's uh, I don't know it's. Uh, there's a couple more, several more good questions and some look like long ones. Uh. <laughs> there, there was one here, just maybe this can be the last one. Um, yeah. Something about TV antennas. So um, this person said, Michael, he says, I've heard about the great schism caused in the local Mennonite community caused by World War I over faith and patriotism. I've also heard stories about a split in the church when television was invented and started to appear in homes. Owning and watching television was verboten, that's forbidden in German, in many congregations. They said they had church spies who looked for TV antennas <laughs> on roofs to tattle on church members as sinners. Probably happened. That, not that these spies would have been officially appointed by the church, but people did sometimes, instead of going and talking to the person directly, which is what they were supposed to do to hold one another accountable, they would go to the bishops or the deacons or whatever and say, so-and-so is doing this or that thing. And then the deacon would come visit you and you'd get a deacon visit. And that's not really how it was supposed to work. The, the discipline system was supposed to be, and this is from Matthew 18. If you had a problem with what a brother or sister was doing, you were supposed to go and talk with them directly yourself and try to resolve it and, and get them back on the straight and narrow. 
if they refused your admonition, mm -hmm. then you were to go to one or two others, which might be the bishop and the deacon or whatever, and go together to them. If they refused that, then it would be brought to the church as an official disciplinary action of the church. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot in that question there. Uh, some of that question involves oral, oral tradition and stories about these things. Um, yeah, there, there, was, there was a group of Mennonites that became Calvary Mennonite Church, Calvary Church of Southerton. They were sometimes called among, I think by the old Mennonites, they were called the TV Mennonites. This is in the early 1950s because they were accepting, that particular group and others were accepting of, of uh, TVs. I'll, I'll say this yet, a, a, just a personal family story related to the TV issue. We have in, in my own family, my my, when my aunt, one aunt and uncle got a TV already, oh, I think it, in the late 1950s, this was, um, and that was, you know, they were maybe pushing it a little bit there. They were members at Salford. And it so happened that my aunt, my dad's grandfather was the preacher at Salford. And the, after the first time that my aunt's grandparents, the preacher and his wife, came to visit at their home and he and preacher Ryan Alderford noticed the TV sitting there somewhere in a corner or whatever. After Ryan went home, he wrote a very, and my aunt has this, he wrote a loving, caring letter to, to her uh, about his concern over this, this, this invasion of their, their home life. It was, it's a very loving, caring letter. And raising deep spiritual concern for the children in the family and, and for her. Um, it's, it's a beautiful letter that she, she has and cherishes. She didn't get rid of the TV, but she kept that letter from him. So he didn't institute any kind of disciplinary action against her in the church? I, I because she don't think so. <laughs> by, by, th by that time, I'd say it was the very late 50s, some old Mennonite families were starting to get TVs. The, the rules, that's one thing to know about the Anabaptist world is the rules may seem arbitrary at times and they can change. They're not set in stone. It's what the community decides is the best path forward for the community. And in the more traditional groups, there's an expectation that everyone will follow the same discipline. And in the progressive groups, there's now no longer the expect expectation that everyone will follow the same path. Um, and so, that's a big difference. Yeah. I think we can probably wrap it up, Joel. Yeah, I think we do need to wrap it up. And I'll say, we'll say thank you again to our attendees, our participants. We had, we had a total of uh, 63 participants. Uh, that was the highest number I saw, 63 today. So we thank you all for That's great. coming and supporting us on our first uh, webinar from the Mennonite Heritage Center. Uh, so thanks thank again you. and have a good evening. Good night.